Well, we are now at part three. And uh, hey, I've kept my promise. Last one was about a 21 minute video. Uh, the first one was about 25 minutes. So this one will be about 20 as well. So uh, I said three part series, about 20 minutes, give or take, give or take. So uh, we are now in the third part of our reading the Bible series and how we can get the most out of the Bible. And so I would encourage you to go back if uh, you're listening to this first. Uh, uh, you probably want to go back and watch part one and then part two, and it kind of makes a little bit more sense. But uh, we are going to talk today about the senses of Scripture. And uh, we'll get into that, what that means. But first, we'll open up in prayer. Together we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh, good and gracious God, as we continue to reflect on your word that you have given to us, we are thankful that you have given us a church that has held sacred these writings, a church that has been a safeguard, that has preserved for us this deposit of the faith. As the Second Vatican Council reminded us, the sacred scripture is the soul of sacred theology. And so we would ask that as we study scripture, as we reflect on it, that you would fill our minds and our hearts with your truth, so that as we reflect on it and contemplate it, we would become more and more like your son, Jesus Christ, who is the word made flesh. In a special way, we ask for the prayers of Mary, who received the word into her very being and gave birth to the word, her son, Jesus Christ. As together we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so we are now into part three, and I said the senses of Scripture. And there's two senses of Scripture. There's the literal and spiritual. The two senses of Scripture, the literal and the spiritual sense. And so as we reflect on the senses of Scripture... That will be in paragraph 115 and following. Uh, the church talks about what these senses of Scripture are, so we're going to reference first the literal sense. It says this in paragraph 116, the literal sense is the meaning conveyed by the words of Scripture and discovered by exegesis, I'll explain that word, following the rules of sound interpretation. All other senses of sacred Scripture are based on the literal. Now, I mentioned that word exegesis. Well, they mentioned that word exegesis. Exa, out from, right? Exit sign. Exegesis is to draw out from. And so exegesis, so if somebody says, I'm doing exegesis of the text, fancy word alert. Oh, sounds so profound. It just means they're drawing out from the text what they're going to talk about. Interpretation, there's another fancy word. That word is hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics refers to the art and science of interpretation, the, 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 the tools, if you will, that we use to go about interpreting the text. So you employ hermeneutics to do exegesis. That's a mouthful. Uh, maybe at the next cocktail party when we can get together, um, again, we can uh, talk about those two words. No, I don't think so. But anyway, so that, the literal sense is based on that. Uh, when you go off to seminary, uh, you know, you, you take classes in Hebrew or Greek or Latin, right? Uh, why do you do that? Well, because the original writings of the scripture, for example, are in Hebrew and Greek, and then you have the Vulgate and the Catholic tradition, which is Latin. So it's, it's helpful if you can at least make your way through the original text. You're able to draw more out from exegesis, right? You're able to gain, oh, look at that. That's a neat thing. Oh, I wonder what that means. The literal also refers to the historical background, all right? Uh, so we study the, the time periods, Second Temple Judaism, the time frame of Jesus, what was life like, the Greco-Roman world, what was going on, right? That provides the historical background. The grammar, we study the grammar, 
right? We look at the, the, the syntax of a sentence and, you know, where the verb is and where the subject is and, you know, where the noun is and, and, and what's the modifier. Like all of those things become important for people like Scott Hahn. They can do this in their sleep. Brant Petrie, John Bergsma, Mary Healy, all those people that you, you Ed Sri, Tim Gray, people that you're very uh, well familiar with. They, they are expert in this, all right? They, you know, when Scott Hahn does a, com when he writes a commentary, Scott Hahn is actually pulling out his Greek New Testament, okay? And he's going to have his Greek New Testament there, and he's going to have all these different, he's going to have all these different commentaries written over the years, over the ages, right? And he's going to glean out from the, the, the studying of the original language, and he's going to, like, pull something together. And say, okay, you know, in the Greek, this is what's being said, okay? That all goes into the literal sense. The kind of literature that the, the writing is. So, for example, we don't read the book of Psalms or the book of Proverbs in the same way that we read the Gospel of Matthew. Why? Because the type of literature is different. That's why when you read the book of Revelation, uh your head could hurt because the type of literature is what's called apocalyptic. It's it's very mystical language. It, it's kind of purposely vague. Well, it's not as clear as, well, then Jesus did this and then Jesus did that, right? Which is written more like a, a biography of Jesus, a historical writing. But all of that goes into the literal sense, culture, grammar, authorship, who the author is. Paul might use a word in a way that maybe John doesn't use the word in that way. All of that comes into play, okay? Remember when I told you about taking Greek 1, you could pick up 1 uh, John or 2 John, and you could actually make your way through that, right? You may not understand everything, but you could actually read it and make some sense of it. You can't do that by reading the Gospel of Luke because Luke's writing is different, and so the grammar there is going to be more intense. All of that plays into the literal sense. And so every understanding of scripture first has its baseline in the literal sense. Okay. But if all we had was the literal sense of scripture, then scripture really just becomes a history lesson. And that's not what sacred scripture is intended for. The Word of God, Hebrews chapter 4 tells us, is living and active. It's a living and active Word. That's why I could read the Word of God today and be moved and drawn ever closer to Christ. Because remember what we said, although God uses human authors, it's the Holy Spirit who's at work in and through those authors to write what he wants them to write, what he wants to communicate to us. So the scripture is not a dead letter. It's not a relic of the past or anything like that. And if all we had was the literal sense, then that's really what scripture becomes, is a history lesson. If you notice at Bible study, one of the things I like to do is I like to pull out the history, and it's important. But you pull out the history... You pull out the background, so that becomes kind of a foundation, a springboard for the spiritual sense. So there's two senses of Scripture, the literal sense and the spiritual sense. And then under the spiritual sense, there's three different kinds. There is what's called the allegorical, and I'm going to add here uh, for myself, for you, allegorical slash typological. Then the second is the moral, and the third is anagogical. Anagogical. I'll explain what each of those mean. The spiritual sense, and this is what the Catechism says in paragraph 117. The spiritual sense, thanks to the unity of God's plan, not only the text of Scripture, but also the realities and events about which it speaks can be signs. In other words, the spiritual sense goes beyond, not against, not against the literal sense, but it goes beyond the literal sense. Pope Benedict XVI in Verbum Domine 
had a beautiful, beautiful line that he used. And he, he talked about how scripture is always a surplus. There's always more. You know, you go into the cabinet, you're looking for that bag of chips. Honey, where's the bag of chips? Kids ate them. It's all gone. Ah, right? There's only so much. I got to go get more. Well, with scripture, it's not like that. You go to the cabinet, if you will, for the scripture, there's always a surplus. There's always more. It's never going to be exhausted. How many times have you read scripture or heard scripture read and preached on? And you've heard this passage so many times, but then something new happens, right? Or you hear scripture read and you swear, that's, that's said to me, right? Well, you don't have to go crazy because if what we believe is true, then yes, something's happening there. The Holy Spirit is bringing that word to bear in your life, in that moment, in that situation, okay? So it's a living and active word, the spiritual sense. So we go beyond just the grammar and just the history, and we go beyond all those things. Those things are important. They're the foundation. The spiritual will never contradict that, but it will always go beyond that, something deeper, okay? And then of that, the deeper, there's the allegorical, and I'm going to add slash typological. Allegorical slash typological. I'll explain what that means. The second, the moral, and the third, the anagogical. So first, the allegorical understanding. Um, it's what it says under paragraph 117. We can acquire a more profound understanding of the events by recognizing the significance of Christ in them. Thus, the crossing of the Red Sea is a type or sign of Christ's victory and Christian baptism. St. Paul does that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where he invokes the story of Israel and the Exodus coming out, right, crossing the Red Sea, and he intertwines that with the Christian story of what they're going through, okay? Or take, for example, Abraham going up to Mount Moriah in Genesis 22 with his son Isaac. And they're going up a three days journey and there's the wood and Isaac is carrying the wood for the sacrifice. And Abraham, his, now of course we know he has a son Ishmael, but in this text, take your son, your one and only son. In other words, his heir, take your heir, your son, who's going to inherit everything. Okay. And he's going up on the mountain and he's going to offer his son on the mountain. And he's carrying the wood. And he's traveling. Well, Isaac and that event prefigures what Jesus will do. Right? He too will carry the wood for his sacrifice. In fact, St. Paul in, invokes that story in Romans when he talks about how the Father did not spare his own Son, but gave himself up for us all. Or David, how David is a type of Christ. Or Boaz. So the allegorical understanding of the spiritual sense is, think of it this way, any, any person, place, thing, or event that prefigures Christ and or his church Remember what I said about how for 15 or so years you don't have the New Testament, you have the Old Testament, and how can they preach Christ from that? And how can Christ, say, beginning with Moses and the prophets, speak about all the things concerning himself in the Scripture? Well, that's how he can do it. That's how the New Testament does it. That's how the gospel proclaimers do it. They show how everything that happened in the Old Testament actually was pointing us towards Christ. So, for example, John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Whoa, who's that? Jesus, the Lamb of God. When was the Lamb of God used? Oh, Passover. What was done to the Lamb of God? Oh, it was sacrificed. What does St. Paul tell us in 1 Corinthians 5? Christ, 
your Passover lamb has been sacrificed. That's an example of the allegory or the typological pointing us to Christ. Any person, place, thing, or event that prefigures Christ and or his church. Right? Remember what we said about St. Augustine and reading the scripture, right? The New Testament lies hidden in the Old, and the Old Testament is revealed in the New. And I said how, you know, when we read the New Testament, we have to read it with our Jewish glasses in order to understand the story, right? That's exactly what it means. Right? So there's these, these things, these illusions, and you make the connections and you go, oh, man, that, that sounds familiar. Well, yeah, it sounds familiar because it's a retelling of the Israel story. So that's the spiritual, the spiritual sense, allegorical. Now we have the spiritual sense, the moral, which is what it says. The events reported in Scripture ought to lead us to act justly, or the opposite, right? Or how not to act. So there's a moral sense of Scripture. So then when we look at the Scripture, we look at those great witnesses of the faith. There's that moral sense, how to act. David and Goliath. There's a great, there's so many wonderful things in that story that kind of touch on typology, but also touch on the moral, right? David is going to stand strong against the enemy Goliath. If he just focused on Goliath, he's going to give up, right? He's going to give up. I can't beat Goliath. But David knows, not in his own power, but in God's power, I can, I can do this. Not because of who I am, but because of who my God is. And so, in the moral sense, be faithful like David was when he faced these great obstacles in his life. What are the Goliaths in your life? What are the things that can swallow up your joy and take your faith, if you will? What are those things? You're getting down because of the quarantine, feeling overwhelmed? Well, be like David and trust in the God who can bring the victory. Right? That's the moral sense. Uh, take, for example, uh, Moses. Right? How Moses, you know, he's, he's so frustrated. Uh, he's overwhelmed. He's overworked. He's tired. He doesn't want to lead this people out of the wilderness. Get somebody else. I can't do that. I can't speak, right? The moral sense. Be like Moses, that even when you don't feel like you're up to the job, even when you feel like you can't do it, what do you do? You persevere. You stay strong. You trust in the Lord who will work through you. Get your source of life from the Lord. Right? God's going to work in and through Moses. And then third, the last sense is the anagogical. And that word literally just means to, to lead up, to draw up, or to bring up. So the anagogical sense, this is what it says, what the anag anagogical sense is. The anagogical sense, we can view the realities and events in terms of their eternal significance, leading us toward our true ha homeland. Thus, the church on earth is a sign of the heavenly Jerusalem. The writer to the letter of Hebrews says, we seek here no earthly city, right? What do we yearn for? What do we want? The Jerusalem from above, right? We want the heavenly Jerusalem to come down, right? The new heavens and the new earth. And so in an anagogical reading, the promised land of Israel, the land of Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey, becomes what? It becomes a sign of the eternal reality the heavenly reality of heaven. What is the true promised land? It's not a land of milk and honey. It's the land in which God shall be all and in all. It prefigures heaven, right? We can take this in so many different directions. But one of the things that's going to deepen your Bible reading is really to appreciate to take the time to reflect on these different senses of Scripture. That's why I mentioned in the first part, you know, those different books. That really helps you with the literal sense. That really does. I can't tell you enough how much that does, right? Who are these people? What's their background? What was going on? Why did Paul write this in Philippi? And what's the reference there? 
oh, okay, that's a Roman imperial reference. So how does that work? Okay, that's the literal sense. But then there's the deeper sense, right? Because if you only stop at the literal sense, it's only a history lesson. But the spiritual sense takes those events, never goes against them. Remember, that's the key. It, spiritual sense never goes against the literal sense. It goes beyond. It's a more. It's a surplus, like Pope Benedict said. And so when we read the scripture and we see the types and the shadows and how all of these things, like the Passover lamb and how they prefigure, or the temple, the, the temple of brick and mortar, and how Jesus is the temple in person. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. John chapter 2. Or the moral sense on how to be faithful. Or the anagogical sense on how to set your mind, as St. Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 3 on things above. So the more you become familiar with that, just to remind you, if you want to see where these are, in the catechism, see what I'm looking at, the catechism right here, okay? Now the catechism. You go from paragraphs 112 through 117, and it touches on the three guidelines that we talked about in part two, and then it talks about the senses, the literal, spiritual, and then the allegorical, moral, and anagogical senses that we just talked about in part three. So there we go. Uh, the next one I'm going to do is what I'll do is I'll kind of, maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll put a concrete uh, example for us. So we'll, we'll look a little bit at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew and incorporate what we just talked about. Nothing like doing that, right? Where you actually can take some of the stuff you just learned and, and test it out and say, hey, here it is. Take it for a test drive and see how it kind of works. All right? So join us next time. God bless everybody.